Welcome to the Powercast with Charlie Johnson. I'm one of the world's leading fitness and transformation coaches. I'm going to be providing you with the tools to build your ultimate body and mind. It's an absolute pleasure today to have uh, Nick on the podcast, world-renowned sleep expert, and who's going to share a ton of knowledge with us, I'm sure, and probably tell us all where we're going wrong. So um, if you want to give us a brief run through about who you are, Nick, what you do, and like your background. Um, yeah, I just got, you know, love sports as a teenager. Um, that was my dream. Uh, I got married, ended up in a, an industry called sleep, um, just to pay the mortgage and stuff like that. And, uh, along that route, uh, sort of got into the role of a sales and marketing director for a very big company and did all that corporate traveling and stuff like that. Um, in the sort of late 90s, maybe a little bit of a midlife crisis, to be honest. Um, sleep was just taken for granted. It's not a performance criteria. It's not even part of the educational process. It's one of those, you know, health pillars that just gets ignored. And so I just happened by chance to get involved with um, an elite sporting group just down the road from my UK office called Manchester United Football Club. Uh, anybody listening, whether they like football or not, you know, they were a big club back then. And just a set of circumstances happened. They went and won a very big treble. There was a lot of media focus on them. Um, I was talking to them about, you know, sort of my concept about sleep. That sort of moved along into other areas with national squads uh, and other premiership football clubs. And over the last two decades, there's been an enormous amount of change. You know, every generation faces change, but wow. You know, I've gone, I've gone from no phone. That's what, that was going to be my first question. I bet that yeah. that's a chain, game change in the sleep world. Like 20 years, and it's a, an amazing shift in how humans behave and the social experiment and all that sort of stuff. And it's just been a really... Uh, long and hard journey going bust every day of the week because nobody gave an interest in the subject but now it's massive for all the right and wrong reasons so you know it's a pleasure to be here talking about it but that's the that's the brief version of my life yeah in terms of you you obviously refer to it there the change in technology i imagine that was in particular in your field has had a huge change in people's lifestyles and probably the issues and challenges around managing sleep perhaps yeah i mean you you know you reflect back uh to the late 90s and uh coaches and managers uh, tracking uh, um, knowledge about human performance was very limited it was sort of like you know get a good night's sleep see you tomorrow at the training ground get on the pitch and do it sort of yeah. thing um you could walk around a city with famous celebrity footballers. Um, and the whole interaction with that process was just leave an autograph yeah. on a shirt. But it was your shirt. It wouldn't go anywhere. So suddenly, you know, all of those things started to interact and some of you start feeling, well, we can't walk around the town anymore because... They're going to take pictures of us from three miles away yeah. and post it on Twitter and Instagram and make things up and all that sort of legislation about things like that, as well as just the ability to do things like this. Yeah. You know, um, suddenly we're on Skype and Zoom calls for free with one guy's in it, you know, riding a bike in Argentina with his AirPods on. Yeah. The other guy's in New Zealand. The other guy's in, you know, all West like Coast of America. And we're all talking while we're riding our bikes. Yeah. And I'm it's real time and live as well, which is amazing. Real time and live, no cost. And we're all on our bikes outside. And there's, you know, it's, I think, you know, there's always a danger that people my age sort of can get classed as being a, old age guys, but, but wow, wow, Charlie, you know, wow. I imagine wow. you can appreciate it more even so, like how many more opportunities there are with the world. The world's almost become smaller in a lot of respects. Everyone has access to each other, I suppose, from every corner of the globe. 
Yeah, and th there's, um, you know, you keep hearing it all the time, don't you? The social experiment that we're in, you know, and, uh, you know, there's businesses like yourselves, you know, that were just unheard of, mm. you know. How long would it have taken me to walk across Manchester to find a gym? Yeah. Now we've got personal trainers. We've got personal trainers online. We've got influencers. We've got everybody. We've got masses of information in front of us. And how we choose and maneuver our way through all of that is, is uh, you know, can be complicated. But I think like most generations, uh, it, it's sort of in a big sort of, big bubble at the moment, but they're good people and the people who can influence, you know, what the next generation is all about will rise to the surface and the rest will just have to go. No, I agree 100%. Going back more to sort of the sleep side of things, how do you think, obviously that's had, I would presume that you would think technology has had more of a negative impact on people's sleep and the way lifestyles may be changed from, from maybe when you first started doing what you're doing? I think it's had a major impact in a positive way, not yeah. necessarily from the sleep tracking side. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of well-being programs that we can all get access to. Yeah. I think it's it's more to do with the fact that we can communicate the lack of education in this area. It's so much easier. So through podcasts, through uh, online communication, through blogs and posts, through just personal free content, we can actually catch up on an education process that's been sadly lacking in and around this area. And where you, you know, the emphasis on sleep, you know, when you mention sleep to people, you know, the, the thing that I just try and not to do is mention the word sleep. Because the immediate perception is something you do at the end of the day when there's nothing left to do. It's not a performance criteria. It doesn't stop Charlie going and doing what he does. It doesn't stop Nick going. It doesn't stop parents, pilots, politicians, nurses, surgeons. It doesn't stop us doing what we need to do. But with a little bit of education, we can actually protect ourselves. So it's, we try to talk more about mental and physical recovery periods rather than sleep. Hmm. We try to redefine naps, you know, snoozers for losers. It's actually, how do you roll through the next 24 hours, 48 hours, next seven days, three, six, five seasons, daylight saving time? How do we roll through all of these changes and have a better understanding how, as human beings, with a brain and bodily functions, we are completely synchronized to the circadian rhythms of the day, which is the sun going around our planet. And if we have a better relationship with that, light, dark, and temperature shifts, and hormone production, and bodily function productions, and internal, external clocks. If just a little bit, a little bit of education, lots of myths and misunderstandings around this whole area, is suddenly you realize that you can actually take control, and you can manage your recovery, but not in the way that you've probably imagined it from the education process that's gone in the past i mean we've left that behind big time no i'm saying i remember like about 10 years ago now to be fair but i remember when i first did my personal training qualification although the standard of that was very poor there was that wasn't even a topic that's covered no which no. is like mind-blowing personal trainer yeah mind -blowing. And sometimes it's like it's two whole decades it's 20 years it's a long long time but in the scheme of things there was no personal trainers. There was no tracking. There was no data collection. There was no nothing. And suddenly now we're here today. So it's an amazing, technology has really exposed us to stuff. And I think the big subject at the moment in the world that I live in is becoming too intrusive. I mean, sort of losing the identity with us as human beings, with brains and bodily functions, losing our identity with that natural circadian rhythm, is we can overindulge in data collection, which can create other problems for ourselves. So there's a lot of professionals that I met maybe 15 years ago, who were really flying the flag for data collection in every single way, you know, accelerometers, this, heart rate, mm -hmm. 
capability, everything. And they're now sort of going, well, we need to just collect the right amount of data. The data that actually makes a difference. Yeah. And we need to challenge that we're going into an area where if we get too intrusive, we take away natural intuitive performance. And listening to your own body. Ability and you say it's, you always take away people listening to their own sort of biofeedback. They just look at the stats instead. Yeah. Because, yeah. like for example, I'm a big fan. I could use like an aura ring, and um, like that obviously that comes up with like a readiness score every day. And sometimes, like you look at that and you're like, mm, I don't. I feel really good. I don't necessarily agree with that. And that's where you have to take in your own <laughs> your own knowledge of how you feel rather than what an app's telling you to do. Listen to your own body rather than than the machine. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things, you know. Um, you know, you've seen that transition of uh, aura rings and various other sort of things that have gone on, and and they get good funding and kickstarters and all that sort of stuff. And it, it's like trying to take advantage of a world that's uneducated. Mm. And so we dip into those things, but it's like you with the aura ring. I know the guys well behind all that and all that sort of stuff, and it's a good step. Mm. At least it's to make you think and everything else but you, that, that's what I like about it. it makes you conscious of your sleep which and then yeah. will make you improve your sleep because you're vaguely aware of it but you just have to be careful of how you interpret the information from it is my opinion yeah and I think I couldn't have said that better you're vaguely aware of it it helps you interpret it and that's why most of those companies come into you know my area and other areas and go how do we interpretate that information that's being collected to actually have an impact on Charlie's life. Mm. Because there's always a danger, you'll just ignore it because if you feel okay but the the device says no, mm. you've still got lots of clients to do, you've still got lots of things you've got to do, you'll still go and do them. So these things don't stop us, they just need to help us on that educational journey. Realign us almost. Yeah. On that point, in terms of obviously using technology, do you think that's something that's going to improve drastically in the next few years coming? Um, yes, it will, because it's happening already. Mm. Um, but it's happened before. Mm. And there's a, whether it's the right, the right word, to be honest, Charlie, the juxtaposition we are in right now. Yeah. We, we've opened up the world sleep. We know it can have a real performance factor, that's a given. We know it can protect ourselves from the complexities of the world we live in. But at the same time, we've been there before. And I think if you start to create data and start to look inside something, it's a very natural process. Um, and I don't want to sound sort of anti-tech here, but there are so many variables, Charlie, so many variables um, to this whole process of natural human recovery. And it doesn't mean to say we can't have a better managed approach to it, but you do help, um, have to understand the, the variables that go on. And, it, and once you get that in place, then we can use technology to try and help us with that mm. but sometimes I don't want to sleep sometimes I can't sleep sometimes I need to sleep at different times during the day sometimes I need to I, 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 I want to go to a party sometimes I'm a long-haul pilot sometimes I'm a surgeon sometimes I'm a personal trainer I've got a client at 12 o'clock at night we have Lots of things going on in our world that we've got to deal with. And it's just having a better balance. So sort of trying to track that process is a big challenge for us all. And there are companies out there who are producing all sorts of things that can, can help us with that. But, I, you know, I sort of say it in two parts. I from my experience and recent experience, I don't think it's something we actually want, but at the same respect, it's going to come. <laughs> you 
yeah. it's sort of a weird one. I've got elite athletes who, you know, just do not want to be tracking something that is so personal. It's the only place they ever get to get away from the world in their bedrooms. The only time they get to spend with their own partners or girlfriends or whatever it might be. Um, sometimes they choose to be gaming or doing stuff. Sometimes they don't want to sleep. You've got chronotypes involved in that. So we've got these early birds and nighttime chronotypes to deal with. So it's kind of like, it's a big old subject. And just trying to label some, you know, technology, wristband, ring, whatever, that's going to manage all of that. I mean, we're just, we're just starting to talk about it, Charlie. Do you think there's too much of a one-size-fits-all approach? Fine, you know? Do you think there's too much of a one-size-fits-all approach being sort of labelled out there? I, I think so, because it's like, you know, the, uh, it's not that it, we're not going to solve this. I think that we, you know, all these conversations like we're having right now, you know, and there's plenty of me around and stuff like that, is I think we're just trying to find a way of redefining our approach to recovery and, and how that looks and how that works for us. And it starts with a lot of education, you know, and then it but just over time we will find a way that we can actually track this and we can actually implement change throughout the day. So we obviously you briefly discussed in terms of variables that affect sleep. What are the main variables you would look at and like to control and to try and improve on? Um, are there any hidden gems that people aren't probably taking into account? I think the, the, the real key to a lot of stuff that I've been doing over the recent years is, is we look at seven key sleep recovery indicators, Charlie, right? And that is one, raising your awareness of the circadian rhythms. It sounds so simple. Just tap it in your browser. Um, it's the sun going around our planet. It's our relationship with light and dark and temperature, and particularly blue light. And a couple of hormones called serotonin and melatonin. So that's one. Number two is understanding your chronotype. Um, the chronotype is a genetic twist. It makes us either morning types or evening types. And that's the relationship with the production of melatonin and serotonin. Beyond that, there is when you're in a sleep clinic, when you're looking at sleep, you look at it in a 90 minute cycle. So we're tracking all the brainwave patterns from the frontal lobe of your brain. And we look at it in 90 minute phases because that's a great way to benchmark how you go through all the sleep stages. So five 90 minute cycles is 7.5 hours, which is where the sort of eight hours slots. And we use the, your natural chronotype wait time not your occupational one, your natural chronotype wait time. We chop your day up into 90 minute cycles, create 16 phases. We look at the four phases of the day between sort of six and 12, 12 and six, six and 12, 12 and six. We look at those phases. We look at your relationship with light and dark, diminished light and temperature. We then create a set of timings when you can wake and when you can sleep. We apply that polyphasic approach rather than a monophasic approach, which is just sleeping in one block, which we only started to adopt when we invented electric light. So there's a multiphasic approach to how you mentally and physically recover every day. So that draws the attention to things like, you know, naps and snoozers for losers and all that sort of stuff. So it, it gives us a more proactive approach to how we're mentally and physically recovering every day. So we're gathering our 35 cycles in a week five a day, but we're not gathering them in just one block at night. We're scheduling them in to maximize mental and physical performance. We then look at a balance between our activity and recovery, which is number five. It's easy to say, you know, it's easy to tell people to chill out and stop worrying about things and all that sort of stuff. But you take them on a little journey when they create little recovery moments, little vacant mind space moments where they're just helping their brain go through a 24 hour process just so because you're in all the other health pillar aspects and I'm doing this really quickly, Charlie, yeah. but in all the other health pillar aspects, 
it's a mental and physical activity. You know, what you eat, what you drink, what you do, what you exercise. But sleep, you're out of control. So when you present yourself to go into a sleep state, a mental and physical recovery state, you are out of control. Your brain is now in control. So this is why the sort of tracking of it becomes a little bit of a, a judgment of, you know, how you accept those details because you are not in control of it. It's everything you do from the point of wake. So when you wake up in the morning, you've got your challenges in front of you, taking the kids to school, going to work, being a personal trainer, whatever it is. And you need to know that during the course of those phases, there are things that you can do that helps the brain so that when you go into a longer phase of sleep, like a nocturnal period, that you're going to help it rele release the best quality you can. That's what you focus on, not necessarily what's happening while you're asleep. Then we look at environments because human beings can sleep anywhere, anytime on anything. We do. You know, trains, planes, sofas, tents, camping, on the side of a mountain, in freezing cold temperatures, in hot temperatures. So we spend a lot of time in certain parts of the a lot of emphasis on bedrooms and boudoirs and private sanctuaries and temperature control and all this sort of stuff and fancy mattresses and pillows and everything else. The fact of the matter is, you know, if Charlie and me sort of run outside, get up into the mountains in a tent with a bit of polyurethane between me and you and the rest of the world, no security whatsoever, lying on some fluffy bit of foam or whatever, but we get attuned to the circadian rhythms. Yes, it's a nice break. But actually, all that's happening is we're becoming synchronized with a very natural process. So we feel great. We visualize great. We take information in great. We seem to deal with things much better. So there's a really important thing about the environments that we sleep in. And we can over-egg it and not look at some of the real science about what helps us sleep in different environments. And then we just look at the products, you know, some fancy pillow, some fancy mattress, some fancy this and fancy that. You know, it, there's a lot of marketing yes. word, bullshit. Um, a perfect night's sleep, Charlie, what's one of those? Can you describe it to me? Yeah, define that. You know, it's just like, come on. It's like, here's your world and this thing that's full of layers is going to actually change it. So... I think we just put those seven key, you know, recovery indicators together. We look, we look at each one of them, see if we can make little changes here, there, and everywhere, little marginal gains, which we're all aware of, that aggregate up to an overall better approach. It's got to be achievable. It's got to be practical. It's not like an investment. It's got to be something that just becomes intuitive in you that as every day unfolds, because we're not in control of it, as all of those variables which you asked me, it's a long answer, but those variables are variables. Somebody annoys me. I didn't plan for that. Um, the plane got delayed. The train got delayed. The bus didn't arrive. My client didn't turn up. Uh, my partner forgot to get, you know, what we were supposed to eat tonight. The kids are doing this and they're supposed to be doing that. The variables are just variables. So it's how they impact on you and that's you know i think why the sort of technique and the book has had such a, a resonance with people all over the planet because we're all the same it's not centric to certain occupations or certain populations or even certain generations you know the the students and the kids out there you know who are gamers, who are 24 seven, who are social media, they actually love my book because it sort of goes, my parents have been telling me rubbish. <laughs> they keep giving me bad advice, like blue light's bad for you, it'll keep you up all night, when actually they should be telling me, the blue light is amazing because it starts the process of being a human being every day. It unsuppresses stuff. It you don't think it the other way around, do you? No, and it's just like, it's Very so good. annoying. It's so annoying to go, shut your tech down. That's one thing, information overload. But shut your tech down because of blue light? God, I can get. I've got screen protectors. I've got diffusers. You know, have a relationship with blue light because 
Sometimes I really want it in the right phase of the day. Sometimes I need to protect myself from it. But I don't want it to be a, a nasty thing, a bad thing. I want it to make it work for me. There's, there's good and bad and everything. You um, referred to it briefly, obviously, there, so in terms of napping and sleeping during the day. So you, would you, from an optimal point of view, if, if people can do, would you suggest splitting up sleep then and having like a shorter 30 minutes sleep during the day and having a short, slightly shorter sleep during the night, if, if practical? Like for myself personally, I always find mid to late afternoon, I get a massive energy crash. And then that's when I end up going to caffeine to then take me back up again, if that makes sense, which I think is fairly common. What's your crown type, Charlie? I naturally wake up early in the morning. As soon as I'm very sensitive to light, as soon as it's in the summer, I wake very, very early, like half four. So I'm more of a morning person. Yeah. I think you balance that in. Um, but, you know, maybe a good example might be there's, um, you know, an athlete that is uh, a single handed round the world sailor to take some extreme. And for three months, they're going to be at sea on a stripped out boat. You know, anything that's on there that's got weight orientated means he's going slower. So they strip it out. For three months, he's going to be on his own or she's going to be on his own, on her own, uh, racing around the world at sea. And they can only leave the deck when there is a number of factors in place right? because it's too dangerous. So they would adopt a multiphasic sleep approach. And that might be 26 minutes every four, six hours. Right? No long blocks, no nothing. You're just grabbing little moments when you can and why you can just to keep that recovery process up. So what you do is you bring them into that process, uh, winding them down into this multiphasic approach. They go into that period. And then when they come out, they readjust and move to maybe not so much multiphasic period. You can't just jump into it. So I think it's all about sort of, I think a good example, I think most people understand around the world is um, that we all know that we can actually fall asleep behind the wheel of a car on a motorway. And you go, why would we choose to do that? Because we don't. It's just that in a set of circumstances, at the right time of day, visualization, sound, all of those things, just the natural stuff that our brain sort of triggers these things off, it'll just go, I'm going to microsleep you in this fatal situation. So I think when you look at naps, it's certainly not snoozers for losers. It's, you know, almost every 90 minutes of your day, these little distracted breaks, you know, me and you, Charlie, we're just like, you know, we run off down, sit by the river, by the coast, somewhere nice, in the garden, on a bench, and suddenly in a very quick space of time, life's not that bad, is it? You know, comes to mind. And that's because we all know that what we're visualizing, our brain processes that stuff. So it's looking at certain stuff, then it creates anxiety, stress, and all those things. If it's looking at other stuff, it creates a different perspective. So our understanding as ourselves as humans and, and creating these little recovery moments, whether we're trying to go to sleep or not, is irrelevant. But just those little vacant mind spaces multiplied over 24 hours, 48 hours, 365 days a year, that's how you build a recovery program and not to focus on just these long hours at night, which is getting more and more complicated for so many more people. So you can, you know, we stopped using that in sport a long time ago. You know, you just, you know, people look at athletes and, you know, some of them get well paid and some of them probably live a pampered life and everything else. But I tell you what, as you will know, Charlie, when you're inside elite sport, they haven't got a minute to themselves, not a minute to themselves. They might earn shed loads of money and do all of this stuff, but they get run ragged. And sometimes creating little recovery moments for athletes like that is an absolute, they just love it because it's the only way they can get through um, the schedules that they get put in front of. And 
there's a lot of organizations now who really are trying to you know we really want to be healthy of course we want to use this technology and knowledge to develop our ability to live longer to to be healthier to you know god we had a under two hour marathon the other week crazy never mind the four minute mile you know so of course we're driven by that and, and a lot of a lot of the clients i work with they just like say nick could i do this in an hour a day because that would free up so much more time <laughs> to do other positive things so i think our drive is to is to try and get to a point where we don't waste time doing this right sleep efficiency essentially yeah yeah we just want to redefine it and make have a way that we're just not Sort of, you know, waking up in the morning, there's only so many hours left before we've got to do it again. And we either force ourselves to sleep. You mentioned before, you know, loads of caffeine gets you up. There's, there's so much we can access online. You know, that's that sort of, it, it's not a negative side. It means we can access so much more, but you need to have more knowledge. So you can get melatonin, sleeping tablets. You can get caffeine loaded chew bars you can get all sorts of stuff without any prescription without any you know people like you giving them good advice you know you can just access it and do it so there's a real massive increase in addictive behavior and that is something that everybody is trying to to slow down and to try and put it in perspective what's your thoughts on uh, meditation it's amazing to, to you like, know, for improving you sleep. Don't to, you don't have to wander down all sorts of different, all meditation really is in our world is just a vacant mind space. You know, you, yeah. you're breathing through your nose, right? In and out through your nose, amazing tool, oxygen levels. We use nose breathing a lot in sports and it's great for recovery because, you know, when you're asleep, you know, when, can you remember when you were an infant? Yeah. And, when you see an infant sleeping, they almost look as though they're not breathing. They're just like, they're not breathing. You have to hold their chest to see what's going up and down. You know, and that is nose breathing. That is just gently taking air in and exhaling in and out through the nose. It's amazing for development. It's amazing for performance because of oxygen levels increasing. But when you actually go into a sleep state, the brain loves it your ability to know. So we actually teach people to nose breathe because we're all mouth breathers. So I think there's, there's lots of, you know, when you start to just put our perception of sleep to one side, just teaching somebody to nose breathe could have a major uh, effect on uh, their ability to recover. And so when, you're, when you talk about that nap, you know, I've got athletes who've just got a really nice visual on the wall. It could be a seascape, it could be Tuscany, it could be friends and family, it could be something, right? They put sounds in their ears that, you know, takes you away. You know, I get athletes to record reading bedtime stories to their kids on their phone, on their device. So when they're in the high-powered world of Tokyo, you know, in a few months ago, they can disappear from where they are by just listening to something that happens, noises and sounds. So the sounds visualization and then they just sit there and nose breathe and just let it happen you know you don't have to force it and that's the good thing about learning to meditate and mindfulness is you don't have to get completely involved with the concept of that it's just the process of just taking a vacant mind space for 20 minutes and just visualizing something listen to something and just just saying, hey, brain, if you want to microsleep me, you can. If you just want to enjoy this moment, do it. Because it's going to protect me later on in the rest of the day. And this whole business of being productive, I mean, I'm sure you've got loads of clients and suddenly starting to realize that you've got clients who are morning chronotypes like you. So they, they love to get in for the early sessions. But are you aware of the other clients who maybe not in the evening sessions? And that whole business of sort of going with the sheep and following the flow. We're all about performance. And when we put these things in context, we can actually create an approach that really reveals performance levels that we've probably not 
experienced yet. And that's what excites me about the sort of next five years of working in elite sports. Is we're, after two decades in it, I think we're now starting to find out, wow, under two hours marathon, come on. Let's, let's go and, and really smash some boundaries in all sorts of areas in life. Because with such a lack of education in sleep, it, it, it's almost, we've got all those negative red flags at the moment, Charlie, which is all about fear factor and obesity, type 2 obesity, you know, burnout, suicides, all this sort of stuff going on. But actually, if you put all that into context and just adopt a very natural recovery process, wow, what could we achieve? That's the exciting thing. Do you say a lot of it's almost people taking back control of their own body and mind in some respects? Like you were talking about Why people not? sitting down and just clearing their head for like two minutes. Why not? Why not? You know, yeah. it's, it's like you said before about, you know, um, technology just keeps moving along. That's fine. It kind of creates all sorts of things that we can take full advantage of. But I think the, I think whether you look at recycling, whether you look at David Attenborough, whether you look at plastics, whether you look at CO2, whether you look at global warming, at the end of the day, we've got to do something. And it is all about humans on this planet. So the more we take control of this natural process, the more we try to redefine it and learn about it so we can have a really great approach, then then we've got every chance of succeeding. But not if we're all knackered. No, if everyone's burnt out. Because we end up with Brexit, we end up with this, we end up with that, we end up that. We end up people saying it's not actually happening. We end up sort of criticising young girls, you know, trying to challenge you know, our mindset about the world. We, we sort of, I think the, the quicker we move into how you eloquently put it, just realizing that we're just human beings with brains and bodily functions. There's a sun going around our planet and we're on a planet. As soon as we get back to some of that relationship and change the way we approach recovery, then I think that would be a paradigm shifter for the next generation. But if we're all under this umbrella of we're knackered, it's that high octane lifestyle almost. Yeah, I mean, you know, I looked at your website, Charlie, and went, oh my God, I'm not speaking to him. <laughs> look at that body. For God's sake, look at him. He's so confident. He's so that. He's got 350 million followers, you know, and all that. But it's not, is it? It's sort of like, you know, I meet lots of influencers, and maybe I'm an influencer. Who knows? But I think. I always enjoy talking to people who've got a, a really good, solid understanding that, you know, it, it, it's a really natural process this is. And if we just start that very simple education, but don't make it too complicated, just start that process, then we're all going to be fine. We're all going to be fine. And it's happening all over the world. What I um, absolutely love about that is it's just completely agrees with my whole thought process and everything, like entirely. Because um, I think so many people they try to micromanage all these small little bits and pieces. They end up getting more stressed about these things, and then they, that that's what affects the sleep because they're worrying about the temperature of their room or having perfect darkness or all these small little things too much. And that's having more of a negative effect than if they just relaxed and just let let it be and let it go, they would be better off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think everybody should listen to that one. It is just this, I mean, you, you ever, you know, Matthew Walker wrote a great book, a neuroscientist, you know, and examining sleep in every single way. It's great. It's wonderful. It gives us information. It should be stuff that we, we learn about at school. But at the end of the day, you've still got to apply it to your lifestyle choices, your career, your partners, and whatever goes on. Those are all the variables. So, it's just managing that to that particular process, but it, it's it's a wonderful place to get to. It's a wonderful place to get to when you stop worrying about sleep. It's amazing because you sort of naturally start doing things. Um, like instead of, you know, as you 
turn left and turn right in everyday life. Whether you go that way or up the stairs instead of taking the lift, whether you're talking to a friend by the window where there's nearly 20,000 locks hitting you, which is rapidly producing serotonin, or you stand three meters away when you're in 150 locks. So there's little light meters, the little things, this relationship with lights, this natural process. You don't have to be outside. You bring the outside in and you take the inside out. It's, it's, a, it's a really amazing place to get to when you think it's quite a big step when suddenly somebody gets an aura ring or a this or a that or that tracker or Garmin, a Fitbit, and they suddenly start tracking their sleep. When actually the first thing you should do is just read a book and go, I know I'm going to handle this now. It's easy. It's easy. I'm just having these little moments. So my recovery is about every 24 hours and every 48 hours. And when you sort of look at over the next seven days, these are all the things that happen I know about. There's all the other things I don't know about. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. I don't know they're coming yet. But when they do, I want to take advantage of the positive things and I want to manage the negative things. I don't want those things to impact me as much as I would like. And you just look at it like that and you go, right, I got my 35 cycles in. Five a day, it's 7.5 hours, it's the eight hours a day, but look how it looked that week. And so, you know, it's an amazing place to get to. And let's hope more people can get there as quick as possible. I understand, agree. In terms of one sort of last point, what's your thought process in using supplements to aid with sleep and to try and get deeper sleep? Do you think there's benefit and value in that or from your experience? I think, you know, eating well, exercising well, uh, meditating, mindfulness, are those supplements? Or are you just talking about things we put in our mouth? Yeah. I think when you, when you look at supplements, if you've got a you know, if you've, for the sake of argument, if you took on the R90 technique, if you've looked at those seven key recovery areas and you've made little changes, once you've got that in place, that sort of natural recovery approach, then you can bring things in to help it. And that could be light, that could be sound, or that could be a supplement. Um, but you can't use a supplement to fix the simple things you should be doing anyway, the, the natural things. There you go. I didn't even have to talk there, did I? You <laughs> answered my question. But there's things like, I'm sure you know, um, if you've got a good approach, and we use it all the time, things like uh, banana tea, you know, yeah. so much more potassium, magnesium in the skin of the banana, chop the ends off, make an infusion tea, you know, tryptophan, serotonin, all rocking, but we chuck the flesh away. There's cherry active, you know, the tart cherry with melatonin, potassium, magnesium. There's all sorts of stuff. But if you go and buy uh, melatonin, yeah, on its own, you don't even do a test, you know, a 24-hour test to see how you're producing melatonin, whether you're indeficient in it or serotonin. You just sort of get it because it apparently makes you sleep. There's um, the sleep supplements. Yeah. Everyone, right? I've got bits of valerian in them, or this or that. Five HTP, magnesium, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, some people use. You know, it used to be back in the day, so sort of have a nice warm drink before you went to bed, and all that sort of stuff. You know, I think there are certain clinical circumstances where supplements can have a real effect on somebody's life, but in general terms, Charlie, you don't need them. You know, you really don't need them. If you're, if you're dipping into those things, uh, because one of those supplements is called alcohol. Right? One of those supplements, you, know, you can look in all sorts of areas where people try to balance that process. And even sleeping tablets, you know, you can get, you can access sleeping tablets online without prescription from any medical advisors now, all the top 10 sleeping tablets and melatonin supplements. You've got things like snoz, you know, the little Scandinavian cultural thing, a little tea mm -hmm. bag on the top of the lift to give you a nicotine hit. Epidemic in certain parts of the world and 
and in certain demographics. So it's so easy to, and as you will know, you know, in sport, if anything is going up your nose or in your mouth, then we need to know where it's come from and what it's going to do and all of those things. So we really try to sort of create a natural approach to this. And, and, and if you've gone through a day or a period of time, high adrenaline, high cortisol, high stress, then don't even try and sleep. You know, because the brain's not in a place to take you into those sleep stages and give you sleep. So don't try and do it. I'd much rather you did other recovery techniques than trying to do it. So I think a lot of the supplements can become very addictive. I mean, you all know in your world, you know, certain athletes, you know, sports that we work with, you know, protein supplements and all sorts of things can become mm. very addictive um, in all sorts of areas. So I would always... There is a, a demographic where the clinical interventions are there, but in general terms, I get people off them all done. So you, with all your athletes, you generally would take a natural holistic approach yeah. basing on lifestyle rather than trying to look down a, the science route with supplements and things. That's a, that's a very interesting answer to know. That's... I know it's sort of, like you said about the sort of journey over two decades and, and suddenly start tracking things and particularly nutrition um, we didn't even talk about gluten you know never mind vegan or this or protein no, it was just nothing and then suddenly all these things you know and then we've got batch cookers we've got all sorts of stuff going on and the thing is with most of the professionals i work with who, who know far more about these areas than i do but i mix with them so i you know i soak it up is a good, healthy, balanced approach. <laughs> and I can see it's my intelligence. But it is a good, you know, so they'll grab a donut. They'll grab a burger. But they grab this and they grab that. They have this. It's, it's just a really healthy, balanced approach to everything from what you're looking at, what you're doing, your social experiences, what you're eating, when you're eating, the highs and lows. It makes you feel good. You know, I was, I was out with my grandkids at the weekend and, we went swimming and did stuff and we're just in the shop and tried to that and we see this little sort of caterpillar birthday cake on offer it's it's got a sell by date on it and my little grandkids just go happy birthday to you and then all right i'll buy them a cake it's not their birthday we put some candles in it they blew the candles out they all had a sing song they felt absolutely great we chopped a bit off the end they had a bit of chocolate cake and they had a happy experience you know? and it's sort of like Everything in a nice, healthy, balanced approach. Yeah. It's easy to say, isn't it, Charlie? And I think that, that's where I think culturally now, I think everyone's got too much of an extreme approach with everything. So like veganism, for example, like it's, there's no moderation involved with everything. I think, again, that comes almost down to like sleep and people's lifestyles where people almost, you know, almost extend where, like, I know I've got some friends, for example, who push themselves work-wise so much, they, they barely sleep where they'd actually probably be more productive, for example, and get more done if they did give themselves a little bit more leeway? Uh, I'll tell you what, you know, we, you sort of do lots of things trying to, as you know, in your world, so you can't tell somebody to do something, you have to take them on a little journey. And they, we would just like, you've got a 60 minute physical intensive program. Mm -hmm. You take 10 minutes out in the changing room, you know, towel over your head, bit of music, in the steam room, whatever. Just take a little vacant mind space out. Yeah? Now do 50 minutes intensive work. Look at the data at the end. Right? You know, look at that at the end. And we know that all these things don't apply to us all. In, but you can start to see that it's a bit sort of tortoise and the hare sort of scenario. Anybody who's old enough to know about that listening to this. But it... You can actually get somewhere quicker, better. I mean, I had this debate with somebody the other day. Well, not a debate. It was just a conversation over a glass of wine and a cold beer. I said, do you actually know how much REM sleep Usain Bolt has got? How many hours he slept? How many light sleep stages he got? How many awakenings he's got? There's no data whatsoever. Fastest man on the planet. 
ever. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody goes quicker. Or the fastest marathon. We don't know, do we? I mean, have you seen the sleep data from the guy who ran under two hours marathon? In fixed conditions, fine. But he still did it. You know, it, even though you've got all of those controlled environment around at the right time, the right place, the right road, the this, the that, absolutely, you still got to do it. Yeah. So take it. How much sleep has he had over the last six months? How much REM sleep? How much non REM sleep? How many hours did he sleep? Not a clue. Not a clue. Maybe you and all your listeners could go and find out. <laughs> so that's, that's why it comes back to you don't really know what the elite are doing from your aura ring to your wristband to this because we've just not been collecting all this data for long enough so you can't you can tell people about heart rate variability you can track those things and pulse rate and all that sort of stuff because there's loads and loads of data to feed off and you can advise people and they can look at it and go oh i need to bring that down stop da, da, da. even if they're just on a treadmill but in this area, can you tell me anything that you have learned over the, that could make me an international athlete or, or, or a successful nurse or whatever from the information? Because there's so much data that's got to be collated. And we've got to look at it in so many different ways. And it will happen, as you asked me before. Of course it will happen. We'll actually find out what makes a 100-meter sprinter do under eight seconds. But we've got to look at that in a much greater, um, you know. Context at all. Yeah. yeah. But we're just on the start of that journey. Yeah. Be, be interesting to see where, well, I imagine from your career, where will be another 10 to 20, 10, 20 years from now then with the, within the sleep industry and, research and where things go from there will be fascinating to see <laughs> yeah it would be fascinating to see but um i uh i think give it another give it another two or three years because you know we don't live in a world of like let's wait for the next 10 years no it happens now There's so much money and uh, pressure on elite sports and performance now. I think it's just um, we're we're gonna we're gonna make some pretty significant shifts over the next couple of years. I think sort of generally, you know, there's, there's too much going on. We need to make more sense of it. And I don't need I don't you know it. The challenges that are there all the time, and this might sound a daft old conversation at this time of night and everything else, but you know, the challenges I face to not use, you know, plastic to recycle stuff, to eat well, to do all sorts of things. I was with a, a large group of people in a big organization, they're all under 25 and their biggest challenge was he's just dealing with the massive information that hits them on a day-to-day -day basis i would agree with that. I, I feel you i feel often overwhelmed sometimes with the amount of incoming yeah, they just feel completely overwhelmed because it's like we need to do charlie's routine we need to do joe wicks's unity we need to start batch cooking we need to start stopping doing that we need to start stopping doing that and they just sit there as human beings and go I just want to have a nice day, yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think, you know, we're all, as most things, humans run to the edge of the cliff. And loads of people fall off and then some people turn around and come back. Yeah. And I think, you know, without dramatizing that much, that sort of element too much, I think that's where we're, we're all sort of, heading towards a point where there'll be certain key people around the world, real influencers, really grounded people, wherever you look, and they'll just go, no, nah, we need to turn around and go the opposite direction pretty damn quick. You say that the moral of the story from the sleep perspective then is to almost turn away from the cliff and follow your own 
instincts of how you feel when it comes to that then rather than listening to all the noise you should be a sleep coach john <laughs> next career i think i think the uh you know almost i've been doing it a lot recently in schools universities premiership football clubs NBA, NFL, whatever it is, all over the world. Um, and I think you always try and start with a really good statement. And I'm going to use that right now because I'm going to nick it off you and make it my own. Because you just go, I just want you to stop thinking about sleep right now. You've got to stop thinking that perception in your head has got to disappear. We've got to change it. So do a 180, as they say in the military in the US. Do a 180, turn around and come this way, right? Come this way now. So, there you go. I like that. We'll, we'll wrap that up there, Nick. Um, that was an absolute pleasure and fascinating to talk with you on the subject in such detail. Um, for anyone to find out any more about yourself, uh, services you offer, and obviously your book that's available, if you could give us a little bit more details on those. Yeah, we're sort of... We're a very small bespoke business, a consultancy business, so we're not, you know, but we are very active on all the normal platforms. Instagram, uh, we like that space at the moment. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, things like that. We post a lot of free content on our website, sportsleepcoach.com. Um, we're keen to, to provide free content as much as we can. Uh, we've got a lot of easy access services, you know, so, ooh, talk to an elite sports sleep coach for the first time, yada, yada. But we've got lots of ways, like the book, yeah. audio versions, little courses, things where people can make those little mini steps into that journey of changing their approach. And um, we're going to do a lot more. Um, there's a lot of organizations asking us to, it's like that little toolkit of change, you know, Make your little steps, do your little things. But uh, sportsleepcoach.com. And I have to say, you know, um, we're a very open business. And our reward is, of course, it's financial. We have to pay our bills. But our reward is changing behavior and rewarding people, whoever they are, at all sorts of levels in life. And... The book is in 14 different languages around the world, so it's not centric to any postcode or population. And that's been a bit overwhelming to see it in Japanese, Chinese, Czech Republic, Romanian, Italian, French. So it's kind of like... What's the book called for anyone who doesn't know, Nick? Oh, it's complicated. It's called Sleep, Charlie. Can't forget that one. <laughs> but I think, you know, anybody, whatever's going on in their head, could they help us with that? Should I ask that question? Maybe that's a bit stupid. Remember, they're on a journey now. We're, we're trying to change things. So no question, nothing is, so just stick it in our email box and you will get an answer and you might even get me talking to you because it might be a fascinating question. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Um, thank you so much for today, Nick. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, if anyone who's listening who enjoyed the podcast, it would be really appreciated if you uh, shared this on your Instagram stories or anything like that. And as always, I'll be picking one person who shares the, story, shares the podcast every week uh, to win a free custom training program. So get sharing. Thank you very much, Nick, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you very much, Charlie. Can I win on your personal You can. Program? I'll send one over. <laughs> Christmas <laughs> present. All right. Cheers, Charlie. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.